Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the third and unfortunately last day of the ITU Digital Forum. Ladies and gentlemen, we've had many interesting discussions within the past two days, and we're going to continue today, starting with this session. Now, green and digital transitions are interconnected and mutually reinforcing. And today's session, entitled Skills for the Green and Digital Transition, well, we have a wide range of uh, panelists and our dear moderator, Ms. Anne Shannon-Baxter, Senior Advocacy Manager from GSMA, will take the floor. All to you. Thank you. Good morning. Welcome, everyone, to this discussion on skills for the green and digital transition. As you heard, my name is Anne Shannon-Baxter. I'm Senior Advocacy Manager on the Digital Inclusion Program at the GSMA and I'm delighted to be moderating this panel today. A bit of background on my work on GSMA and skills specifically. Um, so the GSMA's digital inclusion program works with governments, um, private sector, as well as the mobile industry, other key stakeholders, uh, to further increase access to an adoption of mobile internet, working with underserved populations in low and middle income countries. And our priority is digital skills. Um, through our research, our free training materials and partnerships, to date we've reached 70 million people, uh, impacted the lives of 70 million people with basic digital skills. We plan to do much more. Uh, today, we're going to explore the interplay between both the digital and the green transitions, particularly their impact on skills and jobs. Climate change is the most pressing challenge facing humankind with low- and middle-income countries bearing a disproportionate impact. Technology holds the key to enabling these countries to transition towards a low-carbon and climate-resilient future. Digital solutions are pivotal in driving climate action by reducing greenhouse gas emissions, uh, building resilience in vulnerable communities, as well as promising sustainable management and protection of natural resources. Both the green and digital transitions offer immense potential for new employment opportunities as well as skills development. But in order to help people adapt to this changing landscape, uh, it's important to understand what's preventing people from currently accessing or participating in the digital society. And in low and middle um, income countries, we know that mobile is the primary and often only way that people access the mobile internet or access the internet. And 3.1 billion people still remain unconnected despite living within the coverage area of a mobile network. And GSMA research reveals that a lack of digital skills is a key barrier uh, preventing people from accessing the internet. Uh, it's imperative to address that. Um, the real challenge, though, lies in ensuring a just transition for all, while also empowering people with the necessary skills to adapt uh, to this changing digital environment. And to speak on these important issues, I'm pleased to be joined today by our four expert panelists. I'd first like to welcome Ms. Olga Stryetska, Area Lead on Skills for the Future of Work at the International Labor Organization. Next is Ms. Nanko Madhu, Director of Programs at Afro Labs followed by Dr. Mendel Vandelaar, uh, Director of the Capacity Development Office at the United Nations University and Maastricht University. Last but not least is Dr. Robert Marinkovich, Advisor for Climate Change and Green Economy uh, at the International Organization of Employers. I'd now like to hand over to the panelists to present. After the presentation, we'll open uh, the floor for questions. Olga, over to you. Good morning. It's a third day and early morning, but I hope you still keep your attention. I would like to start from thanking the ITU for inviting the ILO to this fantastic event. Really very interesting. I have been listening with a great attention and uh, great interest so that we can share also some of our approaches and, and findings. So I would like to make uh, four points that I'm afraid may, in fact, uh, uh, make the picture, which is already quite complex, looking a little bit more complex. So the first point I would like to make is that uh, usually when we discuss the green and digital transition, 
there is a kind of assumption that they go in parallel, that they are somehow isolated and they never really cross. What happens in reality, they interact. There is a high level of interaction. Of course, with uh, some um, greening investments, we create new space for innovation, we create new space for new technologies, and digital innovation, digital solutions push ahead the green solutions as well. Also, the green solutions create the new market also for, for digital investments. So there is a lot of interaction, and that means also the skills have to interact in, in, internally as well. Of course, the, there are important um, uh, benefits from the green transition for, uh, from the digital transition, pardon, for um, the green transition, because going uh, digital, when we turn to work from home or learn online, we diminish the uh, uh, carbon footprint. Uh, we know this from uh, the time of uh, COVID-19, uh, how emissions actually uh, give uh, literally and also metaphorically uh, an opportunity to all of us to breathe a little bit. Um, and the same concerns learning. There are estimates that um, online courses consume 90% less energy and 85% fewer CO2 emissions than face-to-face -face courses. So this is a great opportunity which is given by the digital transition to the green transition. But nothing is automatic because, of course, digital technologies also contribute to energy consumption and to e-waste and the sustainability skills are extremely important also for the digital transition itself and also to the way we work in digitally affected sectors, the way we surf, the way we produce. The climate awareness for the digital transition is really key, especially now with the generative AI, when we know that uh, there is a huge trans transformation potential, but at the same time, there is a heavy reliance on data centers and uh, very high use of energy uh, with a very high carbon footprint. And there is an estimate with that the exponential growth in, in recent years would triple uh, in energy consumption just this year. So that's something important to, to keep in mind. The second point which I would like to make is we know all about the disruptive elements of the green transition, and there are a lot of concerns that there might be less jobs in the future than now. We in the ILO produce some important uh, estimates, model-based estimates. This one, very recent, not published yet, so I'm only sharing a couple of uh, findings, not all of them, produced together with Cambridge Econometrics. These are policy scenarios by 2030. So even though there will be disruptive elements of the, of the digital transition, overall, we know that the net employment effects will be positive. There will be many more generated jobs just through, from the, distributing the uh, global uh, broadband connectivity. So in this scenario, we know that there might be another 37, uh, 23 million jobs in addition in the digital scenario, in this very simple digital scenario, in fact. But in fact, the green transition also is disruptive. So there are job gains, many job gains, because it's more labor intensive than, for example, uh, renewable energy is more labor intensive compared to the fossil fuel based uh, energy generation. And there are many comparisons across the sectors that actually say, yes, it's labor intensive, so there will be more jobs generated than lost. But at the same time, there is this disruption element also in the green transition. However, what is important that cumulatively there are some compensatory mechanisms in the two transitions. And if we implement the transition to the renewable energy, energy efficiency, and expand the broadband connectivity, we may be able to generate 57 additional jobs. So that means above those lost. So that's the net uh, effect. Now, the third point I would like to make, and I, this is I think the most important. When we speak about the green transition and digital transition, we don't not only 
often think that they are somehow separate, isolated, never crossing and going in parallel, but they also have a tendency to think that we need digital skills for the digital transition and green skills for the green transition. In reality, when we invest in broadband connectivity or when we invest in renewable energy or energy efficiency, we actually affect many more sectors and many more jobs. So you can see here, these are top 10 occupations that will gain employment. And in fact, they are responsible for the 50% of the overall gain of employment in these two combined policy scenarios. And you see that the top 10 occupations actually represent trade workers, laborers in construction and energy, sales workers, metal, uh, different types of manufacturing, personal services, drivers, and so on. So you see the technical skills, it's a very wide range. And what is important, a lot of these skills are actually prepared not by universities, but by technical vocational education and training, which in many countries really must be reformed, the quality must be pushed up. So now my fourth point, if we keep things as business as usual, the problems from the past will translate into the future. And you see here the suboptimal situation for women. And it's not only in the digital jobs, which might not be very surprising, because this is the, the trend which repeats the pattern from the past. So if women are not trained in digital uh, skills and they are not uh, trained in STEM or in engineering, they are not getting into the uh, digital jobs. But you see that also in the green transition, these are men who will mostly benefit from the creation of green jobs. So in order to break that vicious circle, we need to get more women into uh, training for digi digital affected jobs, or tr uh, jobs that are created as a result of the digital transition and green transition, including in vocational training and including in STEMs and engineering. So this all brings me to the point. Now, when we speak about digital skills, they are just a subset of the overall spectrum of skills which are required for the digital transition. To be successful on the labor market, an individual, young person or old, woman or man, need this composition of very strong digital specialized skills that will also interact with certain sectors, specialized for sectors, Cross-cutting ICT skills, which are portable and make a person more and better employable across different sectors. Soft social-emotional skills that allow them to work in teams, to lead, to innovate, to be creative, to be team player or team leader. And also um, the foundational skills. In this case, this is uh, digital literacy. And when we speak about Green skills, it's the same. Actually, I never use the term green skills. I only say skills for the green transition or skills for green jobs or skills for just transition. That is the term which comes from the ILO, which means that this is the transition, green or digital, which leaves no one behind, that gives an opportunity everybody to benefit from the transition and from the new jobs introduced there. So apart from the whole variety of technical skills, linked to that occupations which I showed you before, in the green transition, one also needs to be a leader, a strategic thinker, a system thinker, um, a team worker, an innovator, and so on. So I will give you one example, because I think one example is always uh, telling more than 100 theory. Um, so let's take a, a plumber. So a plumber who comes to your house, he becomes an important advocate, because he is the one who can introduce you and your household to new solutions which are related to renewable energy. Maybe it's a solar power system related to your heating or you know, water, water heating system, depending on, on the climate and country where you are. Maybe it's a ground hint pump. So he has to be an advocate. This is a soft, soft skill, communication. He has to be a leader because he needs to understand this. He needs to have a good understanding, technical understanding of these renewable energy solutions. He has to be a good plumber. 
he has to have installation skills and maintenance skills related to these new uh, technical solutions. He has to be a great communicator to be able to tell the whole story to the household and to sell the idea. He has to speak or um, read at least <clears throat> English because very often all these explanatory materials are coming in English. And now the complication comes that, for example, in my house, my ground heat pump is linked to the Internet of Things. So we have digital appliances throughout the house that communicate with my cell phone. So that plumber becomes now who? A digital worker as well. He needs to understand the hardware and software of that system. Is he an electrician? It's a very much more complicated profession than it used to be and potentially also more interesting for young people to take if we as educators, as policymakers, can also sell that occupation in the right way and reform the vocational training system that prepares people in the right way. So I'll stop just right there. And in terms of solutions, I think we can tackle them a little bit more during the Q&A session. Thank you. Thank you, Olga. Over to you, Nanko. Good morning again, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you, ITU, for the opportunity. Um, I'm going to be speaking about um, harnessing innovation for Africa's green and digital um, transition. And this is from the perspective of my organization, AfriLabs. AfriLabs, uh, as a way of introduction, is a network of innovation and technology hubs that supports the ecosystem in driving innovation and technology, supporting startups you know, in tackling Africa's challenges. We have over 400 tech hubs within our network across the 53 African countries and 260 cities. Um, the objective, or what I'll basically be talking about in my presentation, is one, highlighting the opportunities uh, and key challenges that exist within Africa around um, hubs in addressing them. Uh, promoting AfriLab's role in skills development around the green economy and what AfriLabs is doing to empower women and youth in the green space, as well as uh, speak to the policy makers here on how they can contribute to you know, um, enhancing the uh, green sector. Now, while a lot of challenges, I'm sure over the past couple of days, or you know, just by the uh, way that we work, we've seen a lot of challenges. I'm gonna just highlight a few of those challenges, but opportunities also exist, you know, that uh, can help us to move this sector forward. Uh, for the challenges, you know, we have extensive, um, extensive mechani mechanization equipment uh, for innovators, for startups within the space. Uh, these um, technologies that enhances the, their work is super expensive for them to procure. We have very, very uh, limited specialized hubs. Uh, out of the you know, 1,000 plus hubs on the continent, only about 150 are specialized in providing support to innovators and startups in the green space. Uh, we have limited data, so research and data you know, that enables your decision making is limited, as well, as well as access to funding and capital for the startups and innovators to, um, to be able to fund their innovations and enterprises. Now, uh, the opportunities are also there. There's an increased internet usage among youths uh, as of as 2021. The penetration in Africa was about 21%, but currently it's at about 40% and growing. So that presents an opportunity that can be leveraged upon to drive the twin transition. Also, uh, adopt, adoption of smart farming and technology across the continent. So we've seen an increase, a rise in adoption of these technologies for farming, agriculture in Africa. Uh, 
There's also increase in the development of green startups. So a lot of the startups in the green economy have also increased. Uh, that shows that there's a viability uh, and an opportunity that can be leveraged upon. And finally, the development of smart cities. Governments are now being very intentional in building smart cities. If you look at Rwanda, the Rwanda smart, smart cities, and other smart cities across the continent, uh, there is a drive and a prison of an opportunity. Now, uh, Afri Labs has done a number of things to, uh, to, to support or address the challenges that I've just mentioned. One is in capacity building and skills development. So one of the challenges that we noticed is that innovators and startups come up with brilliant ideas, you know, that solves challenges in, for example, farming or whatever sector it is that they are working in, but the challenge is the skills in understand the skills they require to function in that space, right? Uh, so in one in a lot of our programs, one of which is the Youth Adapt program, beyond supporting the startups with funding, we also build their capacity and build their skills to be able to function better and provide more solution and be successful in those uh, spaces. In one of our programs, I remember uh, we were looking for startups to fund and it was amazing that we had to even explain, we had to carry our sessions to even explain what climate adaptation was for people to even recognize that they were in that space. So we see that that is a challenge. And that also extends to getting skilled workers to work in, uh, for them in those spaces. We also have, we carry out research and stakeholder mapping uh, in the green space. We carry, in on one of our programs, the green innovation programs, we've been able to map out you know, you know uh, specialized hubs in the green space. And I did mention that we found out that there are just barely 150 of those. We do policy advocacy, where we advocate for governments to drive in, uh, um, funding and support in the green space. Also, cross-sectional collaboration. By the reason of our work, we're able to engage with different stakeholders that support uh, the startup ecosystem in the green space. Now, what are the good practices that we have seen? Um, we've seen that effective policy measures, you know, can enhance, um, you know, the green and the skills and digital transition. Um, we've developed policy pathways. Uh, I mentioned a bit of this already. That helps us to uh, drive. Uh, growth within that space. The policy promotes the integration of green and digital skills into education and vocational training for startups and innovators. We've already also worked on developing harmonized frameworks that government can use so that there's cross um, governmental drive and policies for the sector. Now, uh, Africa specifically, I've mentioned some of these already just to touch on it more. Uh, we've done collaborative learning and school sharing on the GCA program, for example, which is a 12-month um, program that fund, that give funding to over 23 startups, $100,000. We offered capacity building acceleration program to them, uh, out of which, um, they have in turn developed the skills of over 23,000, you know, uh, farm, uh, smallholder farmers, ETC enabled in, for them to be able to leverage on digital technology tools that they provide. We've also offered, you know, training to women under the Green Innovation Program, where stakeholder, uh, smallholder farmers, women particularly, over 4,400 of them, were trained on precision farming, financial management, and 900 of them, based on that training, were able to go ahead and access additional funding. Um, we are big on youths and women. So yes, in our programs, we're, very, we're driving um, capacity building, skills development for women and for uh, youth on the continent. Now, in terms, in conclusion, I want to recommend a number of things to the policymakers here. 
Uh, one is uh, for them to strengthen and enforce legal frameworks for youth and women entrepreneurs. We've been very deliberate in ensuring that women are supported and are driven and are carried along through STEM training like Olga mentioned, right from the early stage and building their skills. Um, we also want the government or policymakers to have a plan Right, come up with a structured plan for skills development and digital transition for youths and women in their community, leveraging on data, uh, monitoring and evaluation to ensure that you know they're upgrading the support that they offer, they're learning from what is, what is working, what is not working, and they're growing. I'm gonna stop there, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Now we'll hear from Dr. Mundo Pandalar. Okay, good morning everyone and thank you for inviting me also to this panel and speak to all of you. My name is Mindel van der Laar. I'm working for United Nations University and Maastricht University and uh, I was asked to talk about the role of higher education in this skill development. As a first start, um, like my colleague Olga already said, I would like to flag that a lot of the skills that we need for the digital transition, as well as the green transition, are skills that also overlap. Um, uh, those two transitions are mutually reinforcing, and the types of skills that we need to enable countries and societies to tackle both are to a large extent similar, but there is also a box in the middle, the colored box here, that would allow for some explanation. The generic skills like leadership, management, soft skills, but also the meta skills like um, a trust or ethics are also both influencing the digital skills transition and the green skill transition, but the specificities, the hard skills, the knowledge, and the softer skills on how to tackle the green and digital transition are, are often specific as well. I asked many of you in the past few days what would be those skills that you in your context would need. And uh, roughly, I came up with the following four groups. There's an e-waste skills. How do we use the e-waste for commercial purposes, like art? How do we sell that art? But also awareness among populations that there is waste in the digital devices that we have and that we maybe should uh, segregate the digital waste as well or rip, not throw away devices but use them a bit more. But also, how do we make sure that the waste industry, the segregation and waste reduction industry is safe also for the people working in it? The second group was the energy use and reduction group basic awareness that the tools and devices that we use take energy is important, but also the data centers that we use to send our emails and to, to use AI services take energy. Um, we could actually use hard skills to develop new equipment, new, uh, new tools to, for instance, use solar panels to create some of that energy. <clears throat> Equally, in e-commerce and services, the use of platforms is very useful and might benefit the green transition. For instance, uh, ride-sharing apps or uh, Airbnb uh, housing apps that could allow us to share the services and the, and the materials that we have, but also e-learning that will allow us to travel less and use less paper. And the last example is less often mentioned, but today it already came up, is the policy design and evaluation. Through the digitalization, we have a lot more data and a lot more information, and we would want to use that to actually allow for a more sustainable society. So we need to start learning how to use the databases that we have to evaluate and design better policies for sustainability. Um, when looking into uh, the, the examples of training programs that are already there, um, I have to say that when looking specifically at skills, there are only very few examples of, of programs that, that already cover the skill development for both transitions. In Europe, there's a couple of Erasmus Plus programs that talk about skill development for entrepreneurs, uh, making their um, industry, their, their businesses more sustainable, but also trainings how to make the ICT sector in itself more sustainable. Um, I, I know that the AFRI labs also had similar examples in Africa, so by far this, this list is not complete. 
Um, I know ITU in its academy also focuses on a couple of courses um, in this field, but clearly the number of training programs that are out there are not sufficient just yet to, uh, to guide the transition. So we need more activity in this space. The role of higher education, in my view, could be split in four sections. Um, first, within higher education, there are skills. We have research skills, we have innovative skills that would allow, in combination with working with the industry, to make new innovations, to find out new ways to use the data better and to, uh, to understand better the examples and the cases that you in the field work on so that we can allow for peer learning and sharing of examples. We also need to adjust our degree education. We need to train the youth in these new fields that the labor market needs so badly. So that means uh, programs like uh, data science, uh, digital transition programs, sustainability programs, and these programs need to work on, um, on the basic skills that we teach the students so that once they enter the labor market, they are able to help making that transition move forward. Uh, but also we need the working population to be trained and retrained. The youth is not able to pick up on all the jobs that we have so far. So we need to make sure that the current working force is well aware of the, um, of the digital needs that we have for sustainability. Now, not all digital skills are supposed to be trained by higher education. Uh, at community level, uh, through informal learning, uh, there is uh, a lot of space to focus on the basic skill development. But within higher education, we really think of how to use AI, machine learning, for a better understanding, better design, and evaluation of policies, and how to uh, train working population to better make innovations within this field. Um, we cannot do that alone. Uh, we know that there is a big divide in, um, in, in funding availability uh, between the global north and south, yet these transitions also happen in the global south, so we need to make sure that there's funding available for people to be trained also there to, to uh, focus on the contextual needs that are out there. Um, and then also within higher education, we need to be mindful of this transition. There is a digital divide um, among students and staff in higher education. We know that higher education itself is mainly available only for the more so for the upper and uh, middle class income families, but we also want to train lower income students. Uh, but we also need to be aware that there's um, a skills divide between the youth and the older, and that means that we may need to reskill some of the higher educational staff as well and be mindful that we need to bring institutions on board in this transition as well. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much. We'll now hear from Robert Marinkovich. Hi, good morning, everyone. So first of all, before, before I start with the presentation, I just wanted to give you a very short um, summary of um, the organization I work for, the International Organization of Employers. We're a global membership network of employers organizations whose members are companies. Our member in Bahrain, for example, is the Bahrain Chamber of Commerce and Industry. We had a representative here yesterday. But we have members in over 140 countries, and um, we're also one of the three official constituents of the International Labor Organization. So we engage in a lot of different processes on um, labor policy, employment issues, and also climate change and sustainable development. Um, I'm glad to be here today, and um, I think you know there was already a lot of important and interesting things that were said. I wanted to perhaps highlight some of them and. Um, um, talk about some other issues as well. I think, you know, first of all, when we talk about green skills, it's important to mention that it's a bit of a fluid concept. Um, there are different definitions based on, um, from different regions or institutions. Uh, like was already mentioned, there's a lot of interactions between green skills and, and digital skills or, or other elements. What is important 
um, I think across the skills landscape is that governments and um, economies develop a, a, an enabling environment, develop a, a framework and uh, infrastructure that you know, um, fosters skills and anticipates skills needs, whether it be digital or green or others. Um, and green skills are often seen as a kind of subset, I think, in, uh, at least in, you know, in today's world, digital skills are much more um, widespread and used as a kind of base for a lot of different jobs, whereas green skills as a concept are a bit more recent and are a bit more specialized usually. Um, and I think you know, I kind of agree with what Olga was saying, this um, expression to rather say um, skills for green jobs or skills for a green transition. I think that's a good way of thinking about it because um, some, for example, some digital skills can enable a green transition, but not necessarily, you know, if you're doing uh, data analysis or software development, that can be in the context of a more green decarbonizing activity, or it can be in the context of a more traditional one. So basically, yeah, there's a lot of, um, a lot of interlinkages that are possible, and we've heard a lot of examples already. I think you know, some of the ones that are the most interesting to highlight, for me at least, are things like uh, data analysis and data collection, smart, um, smart grids, smart systems, um, satellite data, for example. There has been a lot of development of uh, using satellite data for all sorts of purposes, um, like in smart agriculture, for example. I would also like to mention the whole area of uh, geographic information systems, GIS, which is, a, which is a very important and growing area which combines basically the use of um, new technologies and digital systems to provide a lot, more, a lot more precise and a lot more developed data analysis, which then enables things like smart agriculture, like energy efficiency, like renewable energy project development, etc. But again, I think the important thing to keep in mind is that when it comes to smart agriculture, for example, you have a set of skills that can be categorized as green to enable smart agriculture. But then you also have, um, for example, the energy use behind that smart agriculture, which can come from different sources, right? So even though some skills that needed for smart agriculture are green, if the energy sources used for that industry are not, um, are, are not low emission, then it kind of puts into question the whole, you know, greenness of the, of the ecosystem, right? Um, on the other hand, it can also be an enabler, so in increasing efficiency, developing smart agriculture, developing renewable energy, all of these elements require digital skills and at the same time achieve um, decarbonization objectives. So here I also wanted to say that, um, like was mentioned before, there are a lot of opportunities out there for using and combining green and digital skills um, for achieving sustainable development objectives. I think it's also important to mention, like I said before, and this also comes from an ILO study, is that um, digital, digital technologies and skills are currently impacting labor markets much more than, than green skills, right? Um, when it comes to automation, when it comes to the platform economy, um, you know, using things like uh, smartphones, computers, etc., their impact and effect is much more widespread on, on today's labor markets across all regions than, than green skills. I think green skills are more recent and, and, and coming up, but there's still a lot more, a lot more work to do. Um, when it comes to the opportunities, there are some, there's some data on this slide, especially when we look at uh, green jobs and green skills, obviously, and like the scenarios from the ILO show, we can create a lot of jobs through, through implementing some of, these, um, some of these new ways of working. But again, the important thing to keep in mind is that all of this data and all of these positive opportunities and um, scenarios are based on scenarios. They're based on the idea that we implement certain things and we do things properly. So none of this will happen automatically, none of this will happen by default. It will, it will only happen if we have an enabling environment in place, which supports, first of all, you know, education systems and training, which supports um, access to all of those things, which supports enterprises to, to implement um, new ways of working and new technologies. 
and at the end of the day, um, create jobs, right? So you can have all the skills you want, and I think you know this can also touch on the whole area of migration. You can have all the skills you want, but if, if the job to use those skills is not available, then, then the skills are not being put to use. So you have to, sometimes people have to migrate, or basically we need systems in place which can, uh, which can use the skills, and we need systems in place which can you know, create those skills, enable them, and then also create the jobs in the labor market. Um, yeah, before I, before I run out of time, just the last two slides basically is first of all what governments should do in enabling skills, um, digital and green. Like I said, they need appropriate policy frameworks and they need a lot of um, collaboration with employers, with workers, with education institutions. Um, we need, you know, at the end of the day, we need resources in place, right? You need, um, you need financial resources, you need um, human resources, you need to put in place policy frameworks. And I think there we still have a lot of work to do in many, in many regions. And um, finally, also, what is the role here for, for employers? Here on the slide it says EBMOs, these are employer and business membership organizations, so organizations that are members of IOE, for example. I think uh, I would also like to mention the circular economy as a, as a kind of interesting framework that can combine both. We heard a little bit about it from the e-waste management and the repair industry. But employers basically need to anticipate and be flexible. We need a lot more skills anticipation. We need a lot more analysis of labor market needs. And we need to take into account some of these challenges like the geographic misalignment. You know, if you have a renewable energy project, it will use digital and the green skills. Um, but once that project wraps up, you're going to need much less people to maintain the project and keep it going, right? So what do you do with the people who have, um, have now basically finished their job and maybe they have to um, relocate to another area where there's another project or maybe they need to be retrained to do another type of work? So there are a lot of temporal and geographical misalignments and sometimes people have to migrate, sometimes people have to be relocated, sometimes they have to, the employer has to provide uh, um, housing, has to provide training, has to provide uh, you know, social protection, government as well can play a role there. So I think beyond the skills themselves, there is a lot of thought to be put into how to enable and use the skills available and um, create efficient labor markets. So I'll stop there. Um, perhaps the slides can be shared later. There's a couple of resources here for, for further reading. Thank you. Thank you, panelists. Very interesting. Thanks. Like that. So we've heard about, uh, from Robert, the interlinkages between green and digital skills, the role of governments in enabling those skills. Um, from Dr. Vandelar, the role of higher education uh, in the green and digital transitions. Uh, Afrolab's important work uh, empowering women and youth in the transitions. And from ILO's perspective, the opportunities and challenges posed by these transitions and the impact on specific sectors. I'll now open up the floor for questions. Uh, if you do have a question, can you please introduce yourself uh, when taking the floor and indicate to whom your question is directed. Um, I'll take a couple of questions before letting the panelists respond and then take another round of questions. So if we don't get to you first, we will. Any questions? Yes. Hi, my name is Eva from Ghana. Um, my question is, um, it appears there is a flurry of activities and ideas flying around with regards to um, the green solutions and even the digital skills. However, um, funding is a problem. Do we have a source that we can go to to access funding to help us? Because um, I'll give you an example of what we do in Ghana. Um, we are rolling out, and the government is rolling out 2016 rural sites to um, get connectivity to the unserved and the underserved. Um, we have grid sites and solar sites. It would be um, appealing and very good for us if we could access funds to help you know, bridge um, this digital divide by getting more rural sites 
to rural Ghana. So if we can help to access funds, I mean, that will be great. Thank you. Thank you, Eva. Yeah, we actually spoke about this yesterday and the funding challenges. Does anyone want to take that? Um, let me try to, to respond. Of course, uh, funding is a, is a great uh, challenge uh, across very different policies related to the digital transition as well as green transition. Um, the, the scale uh, of uh, required investment into reskilling, upskilling, into reforming technical vocation education training, and also uh, improving the system of lifelong learning is uh, really very large. And therefore, uh, it's, it's impossible just to, to expect that there will be some external fund uh, somehow available. There are important negotiations, actually, at uh, COP. So there, there will be COP29 now occurring uh, in, uh, in Baku, Azerbaijan, in November this year. Uh, so there is a discussion also on the loss and damage. Loss and damage is a compensatory mechanism to developing countries to uh, entitle them to receive some funding uh, for uh, in, in implementing their nationally determined contribution and other types of planning for the climate policy. And the ILO is uh, supporting and propagating very much that that should include also the social policy, the so-called just transition. Um, and I must say, when we speak about uh, reskilling, upskilling, these are very important. I always say that skills are, they, they basically uh, play that double role of an enabler of, of change, or, because if an employer wants to introduce new technology or a new product, this is impossible to do without skills. But the same concerns also policy. So if we have a climate policy uh, or environmental policy more broadly, or digital technology policy, this is impossible to implement without available skills. So it's an enabler, but for this, we actually need also a very good coordinated mechanism for policy uh, formulation, for planning of uh, workforce and, and training, preparing uh, workforce through initial training, the future workforce, but also retraining the current workforce. And therefore, we need a very good coordination across different ministries. We work with the ministries of labor, and but I work in the skills area, and I know how difficult it is sometimes to establish the connection between the Ministry of Labor and the Ministry of Education, let alone Ministry of Environment, Ministry of Energy, Ministry of uh, uh, related to technology, ICT. So we need really to, to make sure that there is this efficient communication. And then the second function of skills is also uh, a buffer, so enabler and a buffer, because if we want to prevent unnecessary, un, un, uh, unwanted uh, effects uh, on, on people, on the labor market, causing unemployment, underemployment, unemployability, unwilling uh, partial employment. This all, uh, of course, has a cost also, cost effect on the economy and the society as a whole. And if we develop skills in a more targeted way, addressing youth, addressing all the workers through some different innovative solutions. That's a win-win for everybody, also for the economy, for government, for employers, and for workers. So in order to make sure that that transition is just, and we also see the role of skills as a buffer, we need to think about uh, solutions of funding where everybody participates so that there is a funding from employers, and I think Robert would, would agree with me, uh, funding, retraining, up, upskilling, uh, reskilling opportunities for, for workforce, investing into apprenticeship training because that's the future workforce, which is very valuable for, for uh, employers as well. From governments, because of course, if there is no uh, investment from government, especially for vulnerable groups or into quality initial education and university education, that will not really push the picture anywhere. But also, uh, we need to listen to the to the voices of, of workers themselves, what they want, what they need, what what actually is happening there. So this one thing, you know, that kind of collective funding and thinking about incentives that allow people accessing 
funding for lifelong learning opportunities as well. And in fact, for Ghana, I have some good news. We have a funding from the European Commission of a new project which will fund the skills packed implementation that, that will deal actually with a double transition of green and digital. So we will be in contact. Great. Thank you. Any other questions? No? Yes, one more. OK, thank you very much. My name is Abna from Ghana, too. Um, listening to the submission from ILO, I've, I see an opportunity for, for us, the DTCs, to have more targeted training for our participants, especially moving into the intermediate levels, okay? So your scenario about the plumber is very, very exciting and a good example. And of course, it's a challenge for uh, the managers of the DTC initiative to assist us with the appropriate content to help us train our participants appropriately. And also there is an opportunity for investing in energy efficiency. Um, I think the first day I was very elaborate about sustainability, especially for ICT centers. So if you are able to invest in energy efficiency solutions, it will drive most of the major cost drivers down and some of our ICTs will be very, very sustainable. So my sister from Tanzania, I think we are getting some solution and making a headway. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, yeah. Thank you. Um, I, I would like to echo actually both of the uh, points made. And I think we, we struggle if we think of skill development with three things. One of them being funding. We need funding to be skilled. Um, I would like to flag that there are a number of online open courses that are freely available, one of them from the UNSSC, but also from INCO. I have the links in my slides, but those are courses that really only explain the phenomena of the transition. What we also need is tailored trainings that actually help the people, the, the workforce, to, to gain the, the skills that they, in their context, specifically need, and those trainings are more expensive. It requires also a willingness from the, from the workforce to be trained. So that's a role of employers to actually push your workforce to keep up with, with the developments. It's, it's a super fast development. So it's not that if you're trained today that you're done tomorrow. This is an ongoing process and we, we don't know which skills will be needed next year as of yet. And we would also need uh, training institutions to make the trainings applied and useful at all levels, at the lower levels on the basic skills how to learn those, but also at the higher levels. Work on the examples of the needs of the people that take the training and make it possible and feasible for them to actually use the training to solve the problems they face in the workforce. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Yes, here. My, my question goes to um, Dr. Mindel and Robert. I think they can share the question. Um, there are countries, perhaps like mine, who are still heavily reliant on, you know, coal uh, as part of, you know, energy generation. And we have seen a lot of, um, we have seen a lot of challenges, uh, so to speak, you know, in terms of provision of energy, um, being reliant on that. I would like to know from you know, a research perspective or from the opportunities that were shared by Robert, what are the potential skills that such countries need to focus on in, in developing the capacity for, for the country? And two, we have also seen um, a lot of increase in solar you know, energy. What would be their input or comment on that? Thanks. Thank you. Should we take one more before going? 
Yes. Thank you to the panel for a really thought-provoking start to the day. I'm Lella Haloon from IBM. So in my opinion, I think that digital skills and the green agenda in particular offers a really exciting opportunity for students and learners to really provide more of a holistic, um, purpose-driven education. So I wanted to ask the panel how they thought that the topic and discussion around um, green and digital skills could really change the wider um, future of education. Great. Can you take this? Yeah, Robert. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for the question on the um, energy systems and sources. I mean, you know, we can definitely talk more about this after the session as well. It's a, it's a big question at the end of the day. I think it comes down to, first of all, economic diversification and on the level of the government development of industrial policies and policies to, to diversify energy sources. And um, it's a complex equation because even, you know, even in um, industrialized and advanced economies um, in Europe, for example, we can see that once you start um, implementing renewable energies like solar and wind, it's very challenging for the electricity grid, it's very challenging for the energy system currently to be 100% renewable, right, because of the intermittency and lack of um, adequate batteries, etc. So I think, first of all, it will take time, you know, it will take um, probably, you know, the, the next several decades. Um, second of all, you need at least, I think, some level of international partnership and co collaboration. You have the example of the Just Energy Transition Partnerships that have been um, that have been agreed in a couple of countries like South Africa. So um, you need to put in place a plan that will, you know, um, phase out coal power progressively. So you will look at, uh, at each power plant, what its life cycle is, how much time it will take to, to phase it out. And during that time, you have to, first of all, retrain the workers and prepare, um, prepare altern alternative employment, economic diversification. Again, it might not be in the same region, etc. The other challenge is that often jobs in the fossil fuel industry are pretty high quality jobs in the sense of, you know, compensation conditions, etc. So you need to figure out different types of jobs that the workers will also be willing to, to transition into. Um, but at the end of the day, I think it's about education and it's about increasing productivity and getting enough resources to be able to do this. And often that involves some international help. Thank you. And maybe to add, um, I'm from a public policy school, so I really don't know anything about uh, engineering or, or those kind of innovations. But uh, what is from the educational sector clear is that if there's a digital divide, which there still is, we will also have a digital skills divide. And it will take time, and it will take funding, and it will take focus to, to make change in that, because the education is really needed also in the, in the global south. more questions? I just, I just want to add. Oh, yes, please. Yeah. So um, with regards to the digital divide, if you look at Africa, for example, uh, the challenge, the di 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 uh, digital divide challenge is beyond even just, you know, the will or pushing people to be upskilled. There's ac uh, accessibility and affordability issues that governments uh, need to begin to look into. I know they're looking into it, but they need to do more uh, because in terms of um, penetration, mobile penetration on the continent is high, but the affordability, you know, for uh, data and uh, the devices is a challenge. So the will by the government, put by the policymakers to push um, for that is essential. Um, also regulation, uh, if you look at the, the uh, example of renewable energy, for example in Nigeria, there's this uh, uptake up of renewable energy to solve power issues, but we've also seen that the quality has also been an issue because of lack of regulations, so people kind of get trained, they upskill themselves, and they just run. So you have substandard installations that is now causing an issue. So there's a need for regulation, even as people get upskilled uh, in these new um, uh, sectors and transitions to, to uh, 
tour. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, and just to jump on what you said, um, penetration is so high, so 96% of the world is covered by a mobile network, yet 3.1 billion people still aren't accessing the internet. Again, it's not just digital skills, but our research shows that handset affordability is a top barrier when we survey people to, you know, you're covered by a network, why are you not using um, uh, mobile internet? And yeah, digital skills and handset affordability, definitely. Any other questions? Yeah. No, adding a little bit on, on I think, on, on both questions. First, on, on transition away from coal, it's, of course, a big challenge, especially in those countries where there is a high reliance on coal. And uh, imagining that we can just overnight retrain workers who lose their jobs in, in coal mining into some renewable energy uh, might be a little bit naive. Uh, so one thing, of course, and as Robert said, should be the pace transition so that people have time also to reskill, upskill. But there should be also some level of uh, social protection. Therefore, informality on the labor market is a huge issue. And in some, in some developing countries, informality is actually 90% of jobs. They are informal. And therefore, people are not really covered by any social protection system. Therefore, you know, if, if there is a challenge to reskill into another job and other occupation, they don't have an income uh, to sustain them, themselves and their families. So therefore, you know, this, this linkage to social protection is extremely important. But then also we need to understand better where they are retrainable. Because we speak about employability, but we also have to think about retrainability, where these people will be willing to go to work. We need to, to, to look at the statistics of the past to understand where they actually went, to what sectors, what jobs. And we are doing it actually now, together with our colleagues from the sectoral um, development uh, department, and also we, we have discussed this with uh, uh, IRENA, the International Re Renewable Energy Agency, uh, to look uh, a little bit more at what is happening in the mining sector. Uh, where these people can go and what can be done, because this is the question which is a little bit of a hot potato issue. And now, on, on education and improving the education, I think it, it's, a, it's a complex subject which goes beyond funding. Of course, funding is very important, uh, and getting the infrastructure, the connectivity in schools is also important. But what is maybe more important is to understand that without uh, understanding what is happening in the world of work, the uh, curricula and competency standards will be always outdated. So that's why you now we propagate very much apprenticeship training. We have a new recommendation which was agreed by employers, workers, and uh, our 187 governments um, that uh, support the quality apprenticeship approach. Uh, with social protection coverage, uh, with wages, with good working conditions, but also that kind of quality apprenticeship that, that then is interesting for young children, but also for employers to build the future, future workforce, but also to, to receive the hands-on practical training. And if you think that apprenticeship training is something applicable only to vocational training, some kind of the lower level of skills, that is not true. Banking sector, digital sector in advanced countries such as Switzerland, for example, relies heavily on apprenticeship training. So it actually penetrates to the higher education sector as well. So this is one thing. But then also, if it's not apprenticeship training, there still should be mechanism or institutions for social dialogue, understanding of what is happening on the labor market for this concrete set of occupations so that the educational institutions and designers of education are well informed. So we support a lot uh, in countries sectoral approaches in building industrial sexual skills councils that represent the world of work and education and training, establish this kind of permanent signaling from the labor market and help to develop an update curricula across, uh, across the sector. Yeah, I think yes up there. Thank you. Yeah, it's very interesting. Um, I don't think we have any time for other questions uh, as our session is coming to an end soon. Uh, but I'd like to ask each of our panelists to summarize your advice in just three words. Who wants to go first? Robert? Well, three words uh, is challenging, but I would like to highlight um, one word would be informality. I think that's, uh, that, that's a challenge that is across the globe and can, can help um, to you know, improve the baseline. 
The other word I would like to use is productivity. I think you know, if we increase productivity, we, you can um, create more financial resources. You can you can um, solve a lot of, a lot of, a lot of other connected issues. Um, and the third word I would like to use is collaboration. At the end of the day, I think you know there needs to be a lot more collaboration and on specific issues across government, employers, workers, etc. Not surprisingly, my, my words are train and retrain, but focus on the local and contextual and institutional needs to make the training usable. Uh, mine will be three words as well. <laughs> so one, um, for policymakers, I'll say plan, okay? Plan to skill, upskill and reskill, you know, in the context of uh, of Africa, invest in TVET uh, as a way of uh, of skilling. Then, at a programmatic level, also I would say collaborate, uh, share cross uh, cross sharing, cross continental, intercontinental knowledge sharing is very important, so people can adopt and contextualize what worked in other climes to their climes. Um, so I will go for three partnership which actually has a very broad context. It's not only partnership between the world of work and education and training and hearing the voices of employers, workers, and designers of education and training, but also partnership across institutions, including UN institutions. We have some very good examples where we combine the approaches. ITU presented yesterday the tool uh, on identifying uh, digital skills on the supply side. And ILO obviously is very strong on the demand side of the labor market. So we implemented together demand supply uh, assessment with some important policy recommendations which are now going into implementation, for example, in South Africa. And I think it's an excellent example when, where we joined forces and it, it really worked the best for the, for the product and the people there. So partnership is one. Second, I think we cannot really achieve what we want without incentivizing. So we need to think in our lifelong learning systems what we do in order providing incentives for everybody supporting lifelong learning. For employers to tax breaks or lady grant systems that support their investment towards reskilling and upskilling of, of workers and providing apprenticeship places for workers themselves to get access to funding, especially for those jobs which are required on the labor market. And also thinking how governments can access funds, for example, through other climate-related policy uh, implementation funding or digital implementation funding. And the third one, to keep the ambition high, because if we are modest, we will never achieve what we want. So I would really call for scaling up through partnership, through incentives, and thinking ambitious about the future. Thank you. I like that last one, ambition. So that brings us to an end. Thank you to each of the panelists today for your very interesting presentations and your perspectives. And thank you all for attending this session on skills for the green and digital transition and for your questions as well. I know that we didn't get to all of them, so please don't hesitate to come up afterward to speak to the panelists. Thank you. Thank you very much, Anne, and our dear panelists for this very informative session. Ladies and gentlemen, we will take a coffee break now, but before we do so, I would like to remind everyone that if you have not registered for the giveaway yet, please head to the ITU booth uh, to do so. This is your last chance to register for the giveaway. And one more thing, we would like to ask all participants to please share their feedback on the ITU Digital Skills Forum, and that is by scanning the QR code that you will see all around the venue. Once you scan the QR code, we would appreciate if you can share your feedback by filling up the questionnaire. So have a good break, and let's all meet back here at 11.15 for our next session. Thank you very much.
See a blipper here, a, a clicker. Just oh. these microphones. Okay. Yeah. We can ask. Yeah. I think the the ones before. I think the clicker could be brought by someone back. Ah, okay. Okay. Yeah, this looks like a clicker. clicker. Is this a clicker? This looks yeah, like a clicker. Like okay. Okay. And I just put it. But I will make sure. Which one is back? I think this one, the red. Because oh, the it's back. Yeah. Okay. Right. Oh, that's good. It's working? Yeah. Is the back and for, uh, forward? Yeah, so that's yeah. forward and that's oh. back. Easy. Yeah. Oh, great. Nice. That's good. And we'll be having a return on. Uh, good morning. Uh -huh. Good morning. You're so organized and ready. <laughs> yeah. 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 No introductions needed there. No. <laughs> no, uh, just we're going to do a Bahraini dance to begin with. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not prepared. It's <laughs> freestyle. Yeah. When, when Spain comes, please tell them. Okay. okay. Yes, yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah. Play the drums and you will leave. Oh, of course. No problem at all. <laughs> Perfect. So, quick information, uh, Ms. Daniel Maria. Uh, um, so, uh, can we see that we have the Prime Minister, no? Stay. Yeah, yeah, Stay. Stay. Exactly. Yes. Well, yeah. Coming soon. So, uh, the clicker is there, I saw you tested yeah, it already, brilliant. What is important is, is really uh, to have your microphones closed, because uh, yesterday we had a case, a gentleman was speaking far away and he was conveying such an important message, but uh, mm. no, exactly. So once he, the moderator had to stand up and um, um, put it close and everybody was happy because it was so interesting what he was okay. saying. Yeah. So it's important that they see, uh, to, to bear in mind of this, then uh, if you feel, if you hear that there is some kind of echo mm -hmm. uh, in the room, uh, yeah, because we have five language interpretation, okay. so you can put the headset uh, and then listen even in English. On it, and better it could be, but probably in okay. English. Maybe all English. Yes. Yes, exactly. But even in English, it's, it's just because of the yeah, 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 yeah. Exactly. Um, what else? We will start with the photo group. Mm -hmm. uh, so just a few minutes before the session. Uh, important, uh, I think, probably you know this already, if you ask the audience for questions, so ask them to, to take the main place, so it's better to see yeah. because sometimes the language yeah. is too strong. Uh, bear in mind that there is also a remote audience, uh, so... Uh, Are we taking questions on remote? No, no, no only to the place people, yeah, yeah, it is webinar point. So I think this is it. Um, you will have a timer uh, yeah, in the middle. Yeah. Are there last questions by the way for the conference? Like, is there a question after that? Uh, there will be the closing okay. in the afternoon. Okay. Mm -hmm. There's lunch and then there is another two. So we're just before lunch. Yes. Yes, perfect. <laughs> it's better than after lunch yeah, when yeah, everyone's yeah, falling asleep. It's great that people are actually. <laughs> Something to look forward to. Yes. Um, I think this is it. Do you, do you have any questions? I think we're good. Beautiful. We're all set. Yeah. Perfect. So I, I leave and I come back. And is it okay to exceed a little bit time since we are the last uh, panel? Just like having an additional probably minute in the presentation because there is some details we need to emphasize. Is it okay? Uh, you won't tell me. I'm not in so I did it. I saw it in your eyes. <laughs> if we do take extra, then it means it's this type of thing. Yeah, exactly. Uh -huh. Because oh, eight fast. is really fast. Oh, and I am like losing my words how fast That's it is right. because I need it to uh, yeah. place everything because there is key information. I did 
uh, work on the presentation to make it like the simpler possible, the key information, and yet eight minutes is challenging. Yeah, yeah. So I'll probably make it ten. Yeah. Or nine. It's or eight. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I'm the last one, yeah. yeah. The last one. And since it is a use case and it's a, a, a country level implementation, I'd like to just share all of it. It would be of some interest of the audience. Okay. I'll, I'll try to do eight. I'll try to speed, but there is a margin. Just to, to not be anxious about the presentation, you know. Yeah, me too. I don't want to rush. Yeah. Well, you say the truth. Yes, we got a presentation that we do. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, don't stay. Clarity. The important don't thing is to get the message through. Yeah. 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 This is, to me, this is the most important thing. Right? But I was listening the whole three days. Everyone's so anxious about the life. Yes. There's a worry that they yes. have to do yes. They don't know how to move forward. Yes. So you guys are going to hopefully help them. Yes. Get the worries, uh, get them over the worries, um, and give them some kind of direction. Yeah. 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 Bring it on to me the, like a recap uh, yeah. while presenting, because we, it will be great to have this perspective that we go through our session. Yeah. So uh, I think it will be helpful. I'm just saying the key thing. Tell him about that. I will, I will bring him. Uh, yes, exactly. So there is. <laughs> yes, there is a cultural performance, and we appoint you as one of the leads. Exactly. <laughs> I like the first. <laughs> so, yes, definitely. Are you a special outfit or a stay? As you make up. The makeup is not a Exactly. No, just just what we say briefly. It's a clicker here. Um, can have your mic when when you have the question, the Q and A. Bring your microphone close to you that we can hear you. And if there is a challenge on sound that you don't understand very well, even if it is in English, put your headset to really uh, hear the, the question. Fellow yeah. And if you need a question, you better repeat it, please ask. Yes, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. The seating plan is for long. Uh, the what time is it? Yes, I would have to display the photo already so you know where you are. So you're going to do introductions as the right? Yes. Five yeah. Five yeah. Right. Because the intro yeah. that is going to be your name and title. No, yeah, of course. <laughs> it's available online anyway, yeah, so yeah, wants exactly. to, for those who want to read. <laughs> I think we're, we're all set. set. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, looking forward. Going yeah. to have a cup of tea. I put my bag behind. Ah, I thought I would give you. So, what time do we come for a photo? In, in one minute. No, in five minutes. In five minutes. Okay. Okay. I'll get a quick tea. Yeah, sure. Yep.
Give it to me, clean up. Yeah. <laughs> Please arrange something else for the repair so it's not clean. But
start with the photo and then uh, When, when, when I'm talking, when because are, are we, are, are we presenting? Present there, yeah. there. So each of you have two mics. Two mics, oh wow. <gasps> you can oh, shit. <laughs> test, test, okay. for a photo. Always late. <laughs> Dear participants, welcome back. Hope everyone had a good food and coffee. Now we're going to continue with our second session of the day, which is the, the future skills requirements in the age of emerging technologies. Uh, please join me in welcoming our panelists and, of course, our moderator, Mr. Alfie Hamid, Head of Global Strategic Partnerships, Cisco Netacad, on the stage. Good luck, everyone. Good morning. Uh, bonjour, ça va? Assalamu alaikum. And to my fellow South Africans, Bolweni, Dubalang, Sanani Bonani. Ladies and gentlemen, I, through these three days, I've been noticing a trend from our audiences today, uh, here present here, and there seems to be this concern about AI. Uh, this concern is real, it's an unknown. However, today, when we're looking at new and emerging technologies, we, there's a need for us to look at how it is impacting the workplace as well as skills needs across all industries. This poses challenges to employers, 
workers, educators, policymakers, researchers, and other stakeholders in the digital economy. For this very reason, we brought together a perspective with an eagle eye, almost similar to the logo that we have. So an eagle eye perspective from eminent st stakeholders as well as experts that you see in front of you today, uh, from both research, higher education, private sector, as well as government. And what are we gonna be looking at today is what economic sectors will be the most impacted by AI technologies, what key skills will be most influenced by AI advancements, what are concrete examples of AI technologies such as Gen AI that will shape the future of skills and jobs. We will also look at what are effective policy measures to address across all these needs and challenges. And how should governments respond to these needs and challenges. So now allow me to introduce you to our esteemed panel. Uh, on my left, immediate left, I have Dr. Stein uh, Brugge, who is a senior economist from OECD, and he leads the Future of Work initiative at his organization. Next to him, we have Mrs. Salma Karim, who is the head of human and capital innovation at the agency de Developmente du Digital Morocco. Sorry, that is French, but my French <laughs> is a bit butchered in my apologies. And then we have Dr. Ashok Jaspara, who is a professor of the School of Business and Management, Digital Organization and Society Research at the University of London. Welcome, Doctor. And then we have Mariam Al Alhi, who is a business development manager, training and certification emerging markets at Amazon Web Services. To start us off and to set the stage, I invite Dr. Stein to give us a presentation. Over to you, Dr. Stein. Thank you very much, Alfie, for the introduction. Uh, this is the problem of being told is that the microphone is always too far, so I hope I speak loud enough. Um, it's a pleasure to be here, and it's very nice to speak to a wider set of countries than we usually speak to at the OECD and to interact with people from other parts of the world as well. So I've been asked to set the scene, and as Alfie told me that some of you are very scared, um, scared about AI and the impact that it will have. So I'm here to try and tell you that maybe you shouldn't be so scared, at least not so scared about a jobless future, but there may be other things that we should be concerned about, and hopefully my presentation will give you some food for thought. So there is the presentation, and let's start. So this is the reason why many of you are scared, I think. We hear a lot of figures, and these are some figures that we have estimated at the OECD, which are estimates of the risk of automation due to AI, but also due to other technologies. And as you can see, these, this risk seems quite high. On average, you have almost a third of jobs that are in occupations that are at high risk of automation. So these are jobs that may well disappear, theoretically at least. Because in practice, that's not what we're seeing. In practice, when you look at OECD countries, in nearly every single country, employment is at a record high despite automating technologies. So why is that? Because it is the case that technology does destroy some tasks and technology does destroy some jobs, and yet employment is at a, is at a record high. Well, first of all, these estimates of automation that I showed you before are theoretical estimates. And it's not because something is theoretically possible that it will necessarily happen. First of all, it needs to make business sense to adopt a certain technology. You need to make, there needs to be a rate of return to investing in those technologies. Second, there are lots of legal, social, and other reasons why some technologies are not adopted. Uh, think about driverless cars, for example. There are plenty of obstacles still that prevent us from using driverless cars. But also, technology doesn't just destroy jobs. Technology creates jobs. And there are two channels through which technology can create jobs. The first one is 
directly jobs that are related, for example, here to artificial intelligence. In order to develop AI, in order to maintain it, we need people with specialized AI skills. And certainly when we look, for example, at these three countries, what we do here is we look at the vacancies that employers have posted over the last decade or so. And as you can see, there's been a tremendous increase in demand for people with AI skills, so people who can develop and maintain AI technologies. A very fast increase. So these are new jobs, jobs that didn't really exist before. But if you look at the scale of this graph, you'll notice that this is a very small share of overall vacancies. We're talking about 0.6% of vacancies of jobs overall. So yes, we're creating new jobs as AI specialists, but that's not going to solve an employment problem. I think the main channel through which AI creates jobs is an indirect way. What we've done here in this graph is we have, on the one hand, we have, so at the bottom you see, we have mapped exposure to AI, so occupations. The further you are from me, the more exposed you're likely to be to artificial intelligence in your job. And on the vertical axis, I show you the change in employment over the last 10 years or so. And what do you see? You don't see a negative relationship. It's not that the more exposed you are to AI, the less job growth you see. You see the opposite. Occupations more exposed to AI see more job growth. And also what you see is that the occupations that see most job growth, the occupations that are most exposed to AI, tend to be high-skilled occupations. So we see growth in those occupations. Why is that? Likely there's a productivity effect. AI makes these workers more productive, and by making workers more productive, they produce goods and services that are cheaper, higher quality, so you increase the demand for these goods and services, and under the right circumstances, that also increases the demand for the workers in these uh, occupations. But also, these high-skilled occupations that are most exposed to AI, one of the reasons that their jobs are not being automated is because the workers in these occupations have many skills that cannot be automated yet, which we call bottleneck uh, skills. So yes, some of their tasks will be automated, some of their skills will become redundant, but they have so many other skills that they can move more, use more of to, to apply to other tasks in their jobs. And that's why, despite being exposed to AI more than other workers, they don't risk automation by AI as much. Whereas if you look at low educated workers, what I show you here is the black bars are the change in employment for low educated workers, the middle bars are a change in employment for middle educated workers, and the green bars are a change in employment for high educated workers. And what you see in, all, in many OECD countries is a decline in jobs for low educated workers and an increase in jobs for high educated workers. Now, in a way, this is good news because we are creating more, better jobs. But that's only good news if we make sure that our education systems keep pace with this change. In most OECD countries, at least, that has been the case. There's been tremendous progress in educational attainment, and so even though there's fewer jobs for low-educated workers, we also have fewer low-educated workers. But there's something more interesting happening underneath the surface, also for high-skilled workers. I want you to focus on the left side, on the left graph first. So what we do here is we look at jobs that are highly exposed to AI. And this is based on vacancies that employers post, and we look at the kind of skills that are demanded in jobs that are highly exposed to AI. In those jobs, there's very high demand for digital skills, social and emotional skills, and also business and management skills. And overall, when we look at all vacancies, we still see an increase in demand for those types of skills. But then we do something very interesting in the right-hand graph. We look at workplaces that have been most exposed to AI. And in those workplaces, we see a small decline in demand for certain skills, for these exact skills that I just talked about. Digital skills, interestingly, but also especially business and management skills. So before you start panicking, let me try and explain what this means. 
These business and management skills, what are they? We're talking about project management, budgeting, accounting, clerical administration skills, basic word processing and spreadsheet skills. So what are these skills? These are the skills of, of white collar support workers. So people who work in finance, HR, legal communications, administrative assistants, project managers. These are the kind of skills that AI is beginning to take over. These are the kind of tasks that AI can do. Now, before we start panicking, this is very indicative evidence. Some other researchers have confirmed it. The size of the magnitude is very small. And we should also remember that this happens to these specific occupations that I'm just mentioned. It's not that these occupations will disappear, but there may well be a change in the demand of this for the skills that these workers need. And this is what we're talking about here. It's not that jobs will disappear. It's not that jobs will be destroyed, that we face a uh, jobless future. But we will see constant change in the skills that are needed in the jobs that we do. And I think that is the biggest challenge that we deal, uh, have to deal with. Now, employers tell us that they are doing something about this, which is good. So in 2022, we did a survey uh, across seven OECD countries in the manufacturing and finance sector of these countries, both of employers and workers in these sectors. And employers, we asked them, how are you dealing with the impact of AI on the workplace? Now, very few tell us that they use att attrition or redundancies to adjust the workforce. Many, in fact, tell us, especially in case studies that we've done also, tell us that they don't recruit as much as they used to. But the main channel that they use to adjust for skills changes is training. You see that a very large percent, two in three employers, tell us that they are retraining workers to deal with the changes that AI is bringing to the workplace. And this is a very good thing, because in the same surveys when we spoke to workers, workers told us that if they are trained to work with AI, they're also more positive about the outcomes of AI or, or the impact of AI on their jobs. So we asked them about a number of outcomes. We asked them about the impact of AI on their performance. We asked about the impact of AI on their enjoyment of their jobs, on their physical and mental health. And each time you see two bars. On the left, you see the bar of people who said they've received training to work with AI. And then next to it, you see the bar for people who said they did not receive training to work with AI. And you can see that the workers who have received training are far more positive about the impact of AI on their jobs than people who did not receive training, which highlights the importance of training to make a success of this transition. But also the sign is that maybe we are not doing enough, or employers at least cannot deal with the issue by themselves. Again, in these surveys, we asked about barriers to employment, uh, sorry, uh, barriers to the adoption uh, of AI. And one of the main barriers that came out was employers telling us they don't have the skills necessary to adopt these technologies in the workplace. So we have at least a third in countries, sometimes even more, of employers telling us they have a skill shortage to adopt these technologies. So there does seem to be a role for government here. And that's what I want to focus on in the last two slides of my presentations. I have two minutes left, so I'm well within time. So what do we need to do? I think, first of all, the slide where I showed you a decline in demand for certain types of skills in workplaces that are highly exposed to AI. This was indicative evidence, but it's something that we need to monitor very, very closely because it may well be a trend that continues, especially as the adoption of AI accelerates and more and more companies start using AI. So we need to keep close tabs on how the labor market is changing and how skills needs are changing so that we can prepare ourselves, we can prepare our education and training systems for this change. If possible, we should try and build in some element of anticipation, some element of forecasting into this system so that we know or we more prepare for the future also and we can think about how over the next few years our education and training provision needs to adapt. What is clear from all our research so far on the impact of AI is that we need to invest in more training and education at all levels of the system. In initial education, I'll come back to this in a second, but also in continuous learning and development. It's not when people leave the education system that they won't need training anymore. In fact, 
we all will live longer, we will have longer careers, and we will face more change in our jobs and careers than our parents and our grandparents did. So we will face this continuous change and we'll need continuously, we will need continuously to, need, uh, to adapt to these changes in our jobs. Now, of course, this is a wish list. The problem is we have very finite resources. I heard questions in the previous uh, uh, panel on uh, funding for these kind of programs. Of course, our, our resources are limited, and we need to make sure that we invest those resources where they are most needed. And here I'm talking in particular about the most vulnerable workers and also about companies that struggle maybe to adopt these technologies like small and medium-sized enterprises because then they risk to fall further and further behind on larger companies. And very, very briefly, my very last slide is on what type of training and who to target. I think this is a little bit complicated because on the one hand, we will need specialized skills. We will need skills to develop, to maintain AI. But I think in general, the market seems to respond quite well to this uh, demand for skills. At least this is what we're seeing so far in OECD countries, that the market mechanism works quite well in developing these high level skills. But we also need to develop a general knowledge of AI, which I think we can refer to as AI literacy, because I think one of the biggest risks, which we didn't talk about here today, is about how AI is used in the workplace and the impact it has, say, on worker privacy, the impact that automated decision-making and algorithmic management have on workers' rights. I think this is one of the big, biggest risks, and we need to make sure that managers, workers, understand what these technologies are, what they can and what they cannot do. And finally, I already mentioned the issue of targeting on the most vulnerable workers uh, because it's simply a question of equity, but also make, uh, making sure that these workers don't fall behind. But also, of course, the high-skilled workers are also needed for productivity. So I, I think there's a dual approach that is required here. So I think I've come to the end of my presentation here, and I very much look forward to the next presentations and the discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Stein. I really appreciate uh, your setting the tone, setting the scenes, and this a quick word, some few uh, synopsis of what you said, is that one third of the workforce basically is at risk. And tech creates jobs, it does not take away, it creates and enhances jobs. So I hope it has taken away that, that concern that we tend to have, as well as occupations more exposed tend to be tend to have higher growth. Uh, importantly, there's a need for employers, and employers are doing that. They are doing retraining. I, for example, can tell you that uh, myself being at Cisco, we were very concerned about AI, and the company had literally blocked in two months, one after the other, a whole day where every single employee had to go on AI training. And today, if you ask anyone at our company, we are very comfortable with AI. So it's something that needs to happen, that awareness of what AI is and how to use it needs to happen all over. And there's a need for close monitoring. Training has to go on, and there's an appeal for an AI literacy course. And uh, I think the good news for all of you is there are several AI literacy courses out there. Uh, you just need to go onto the web, search for it. It doesn't take that long. Maximum, it will take you about two hours, three hours to learn the basics of what AI is. And now, oh, we already have Ashok here. Dr. Ashok uh, Jaspara is going to take us through something else that's going to help settle our minds. He's going to take us through the types of AI technologies, in particular looking at uh, Gen AI, ChatGPT, or Gemini, uh, that have significant impact on the future of tasks and skills. And then he'll also look at the role of higher education uh, and how that is preparing the workforce for automation, especially in developing countries. Uh, Dr. Ashok, over to you. Thank you, Alfie. Um, let me just start by saying what a joy it has been for me just to be here over the last three days. It's been fantastic just getting that time to have a chat with so many of you, either individually or around the lunch table. It's been really inspiring, and I hope we can stay in touch after this forum. Um, I'm going to provide the university perspective, what's happening in higher education. 
Um, and it was lovely that Mindell from UN University was sharing some of the similar thoughts that we have uh, at London University. So first of all, I'm, uh, these are some of the things I'm going to go through. Oops, hoping I can get this to work. Ooh. Nothing's happening. Oh, am I doing something wrong? Oh, do you go backwards? Okay, it looks like I go backwards. Forwards. If I go back, back to the beginning. Back to the beginning. Okay. Yep. Okay, let's kick off here. Often people get um, totally fixated by AI technology, AI tools. Where I'm coming from, particularly in higher education, is they're tools at the end of the day, but it's about how do we implement it in organizations, whether you're a private firm, a public organization, a government organization, how do you use it to add value in some way to your organization? So the, first of all, I'm just going to look at some of the key tools that we're talking about in terms of AI. Uh, Alfie talked about Gen AI, which of course is an advanced language model. That's creating a huge problem for a lot of us in universities around the world, because what we're finding is that you give students an essay, they put it into Gen AI, um, and suddenly they've got this brilliant, convincing looking essay. However, it's only if you start digging deeper, you find that the essay is quite shallow. But what's happening is that there's two things. I, I'm an external examiner at a number of universities where there's a shift more towards uh, exams and vivas. But it's interesting that what we're doing is that we're saying, no, use uh, advanced language models but you've got to show us what you've done. Put that in the appendices, but use that as a starting point. And then from there, we're really interested in your uh, creative thinking, your critical thinking we've heard quite a bit of in the last few days, and then bringing it together in a very different way. One of the things that's hopeless in these ad advanced language models is that hopeless at referencing anything. So we say, look, you've come to university to read. We would like you to read books and journals and so on. So it's really saying when our students go into the workplace, they will use uh, generative AI. So we're saying, yeah, do carry on using it. Other technologies, uh, natural language processing. I was really inspired by the young people at the back yesterday looking at chatbots. Um, also, the whole area of sentiment analysis, where as organizations we can quickly see what social media is saying about us in the last week, the last month, and so on. Um, Sten has just mentioned uh, autonomous vehicles with computer vision. Uh, we've got uh, reinforced learning, where we're learning by trial and error. A lot of what we're doing at the moment is around predictive analytics, but it's recognizing it's not new. Every university in the last 50, 100 years has been teaching statistics. Just because we've got machine learning algorithms, I've often found that they're not necessarily better than some of the statistical algorithms. So it's not saying machine learning somehow is going to answer all our questions. Also, AI being used a lot in healthcare, um, uh, really sort of transforming healthcare. I realize I'm getting a bit delayed with my timing. Um, let's look at how do we transfer our knowledge from where we are at University of London, particularly to developing countries and so on. So saying that we do go in for joint degree programs with other parts of the world. Um, we do exchange initiatives, um, huge explosion of open um, learning platforms. A lot of you may have heard of MOOCs, of saying that a lot of them are free. They provide you with the um, AI training and so on. There's a lot of research collaboration and knowledge sharing. Um, 
But a large part of it is developing those linkages. And it's also, I think what I've heard the last few days is about training the trainers because many of us academics aren't the younger crowd. We need to be trained in these AI, AI skills ourselves to then train uh, the incoming uh, group of students. So knowledge transfer, yes, we've been involved with a lot of uh, faculty training. We get involved with uh, providing technology, infrastructure support, a lot of scholarships. Um, but it's interesting that um, yesterday uh, there was a mention of hackathons. And we actually do datathons with lots of universities, where we say to the students, we don't care what platforms you use, but what we're going to do we're going to all give you the same data set, the same business or management problem, and we want you to work together, hopefully in groups across different uh, national divides, to come up with what solutions you would suggest that the executive needs to make in terms of that decision making. Future trends, uh, it's all moving towards personalized learning experiences. So it's recognizing some of you will have heard of people like Honey and Mumford and learning styles, that we're all individuals. We learn in different ways. So it's really saying, how do, can we use AI in the way of helping different ones of us that learn in very, very different ways uh, to others? There's this whole thing that People are in and out of work nowadays. So it's really saying that we as universities are changing. Instead of saying, look, you come in just to do full-time degrees, we're becoming much more flexible and with allowing people to get these micro-credentials and other forms of credits to develop over a few years to get some form of certificate, diploma, degree, or whatever. Um, we're really keen in developing communities and developing these learning communities because for us it's so important that rather than just developing an individual in an area, we're really into developing online communities of past students, current students, and students from different institutions. So we're all learning together, asking the same questions, and when it's really buzzing, it's just incredible uh, what you see. Right, I've almost run out of time, but I'm just going to give you, I was asked to give you almost like a little bibliography of thinking, oh, what, what, what areas do you think some of the sort of key thinkers are in the world? Um, the Harvard Business Review, they do an annual AI um, uh, review of what's changing in public and private sector organizations. It's really well worth you uh, checking that out. There are a lot of people at uh, Stanford, such as Eric uh, Bjorn Olsen. Um, there's Andrew Ning. Uh, he's in the computer science department. Um, another one uh, that I've mentioned here is David Author. He's a professor of economics at uh, MIT. Also, there's uh, Mariano Musacato, and particularly for so many of you who are policy-led uh, people, she provides a fascinating uh, perspective of saying, hang on, you're really into looking at market failures and facilitating markets. No, have you ever thought of going into mission-focused policies, really? So just a session before us, we were looking at sustainability and green health. Well, we, we could be looking at health, we could be looking at digital inclusion, but it's about almost using the Apollo rocket metaphor. How do we propel our policies for a certain goal within organizations, rather than just looking at how do we improve markets? Uh, so looking, instead of the past, we're looking more at the future. I'm really out of time, so thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Ashok. Uh, and once again, you can see that Dr. Ashok has tied in uh, with what uh, Dr. Stain has covered. Um, Gen AI or AI can be found in different fields. You have Gen AI, you have AI in health, AI in finance, so in all different sectors. Now, you know, growing up, there's something that uh, my dad always told me. 
is that if you want to win, keep your competition close to you. Know what your competition is doing. And I think this is something that we need to do as well. We see the education sector is doing that, it's preparing us, there's plenty of courses available, micro-credentials, et cetera, that's being made available. The advice is, you see AI as a competition, keep AI close to you. And how do you keep it close to you? Is by, by getting to know what is AI. So go out there, tell your communities to get to know what is AI, keep it close to you, and start working with AI. Uh, I would now invite our next speaker, Salma. Uh, oh, sorry. We have Mariam Ali. <laughs> Mariam Ali from um, Amazon. Mariam, over to you. Thank you, Alfie. Good afternoon and good morning, everyone. Making sure the slides work. OK. So building on what Alfie and my esteemed panelists discussed, generative AI will reinvent every customer experience and application. While there, be, there has been a lot of attention on how consumers are using generative AI, we believe businesses can use it to deliver amazing experiences for their customers and employees. According to a report by the World Economic Forum in 2023, Future of Jobs, it states that more than 75% of organizations are willing to adopt technologies such as cloud computing, big data, and artificial intelligence in the next five years. Another interesting study done by AWS and research firm Access Partnership in November 2023 states very important data points. The need for an AI-savvy workforce has never been greater. In this study, we found out that 93% of organizations plan to use AI-powered solutions in 20, by 2028. Seven, more than 73% of the employers say it's a priority for them to find AI-skilled talent. And employers are saying workers with AI-skilled talent can expect more than 47% increase in their salaries. However, three out of four, 75% of their employers are not able to find the AI-skilled talent that they need. The skills gap is big, and we need to collab collaborate between the private sector, public sector, educational institutions, and policymakers to address this. At AWS, our approach to drive transformation through machine learning and AI skills is through three key strategies. Number one, upskill your current talent. The talent that you need is probably the talent that you have. They need to be geared and put on new learning plans to address these emerging technologies. Secondly, activate your non-technical talent. Building on what my panelists discussed, your sales teams, your marketing teams, HR, and other teams need to be dragged along into this journey. They need to understand how they can innovate with AI in their roles. Actually, earlier this summer at Amazon Web Services, we launched the AI Certification Challenge. It's a challenge that aims to certify 2,000 of our own employees, technical and non-technical, on the latest AI certifications and Gen AI and machine learning. Finally, Tap into, an, a, tap into a pipeline of entry-level talent in order to add value to your organizations. At AWS, we have been investing in programs to build that kind of learner uh, uh, community in order to them to be hired by your organizations and add value to your organizations. It is imperative that the private sector invests proactively and heavily in building the workforce development. In addition to the role that the private sector plays, the private sector has to also collaborate with educational institutions that bring in the academic rigor and the foundational knowledge and tie it to the practical hands-on experience and industry knowledge from the private sector. The way we do that at AWS is through a set of programs like the AWS education programs. We have been investing in the last years heavily in these programs, the likes of AWS Educate, this is a free self-paced digital platform geared towards students to access anytime, anywhere, enabling themselves on the latest technologies. AWS Academy, this is a program geared specifically towards universities. We provide the universities with free cloud computing curricula so that they can make it available for their students. We also enable their facilitators to support the students on their journey. 
AWS skill, skill centers, those are in-person learning spaces available across the globe for learners who wish to enable themselves on the latest technologies. AWS Restart, this is a program that targets job seekers, unemployed individuals, and any individ individual who wants to change their career shift or make a career shift. This is a 12 weeks cohort-based program that has an employability component at the end. We connect the, lear the learners at the end of the program with local employers in their region. And finally, AWS Cloud Institute. This is a 12 course virtual academy where we basically we are targeting to graduate entry-level developers. In addition to the educational programs at AWS, we have also announced and delivered on global and regional initiatives. In 2020, we announced our target to train for free 29 million learners across the globe on cloud computing by 2025. And I have, I'm glad to say that we've already surpassed that number, and now we're looking at the next big number. In 2023, we also announced an AI-focused initiative focused on training 2 million people for free on AI technologies named AI Ready. Bringing the picture closely, closer to our region in the Middle East, in 2021, AWS collaborated with the Ministry of Communication and IT in Egypt to help them address a skills gap in machine learning and AI. We basically enrolled 500 fresh graduates in the program, uh, specifically focusing on machine learning and AI. In 2023, AWS and Amazon also collaborated with the Ministry of Communication and IT in Saudi Arabia. We announced Amazon Academy. This is an initiative that focuses on enabling 30,000 30, Saudi nationals on cloud computing skills, specifically machine learning and artificial intelligence, making available 35,000 certification vouchers of the AWS international certifications and 100 internship opportunities. Also, earlier this year, during the announcement of the AWS Saudi Arabia infrastructure region launch, we announced three new initiatives. One targeting women, where we aim to train 4,000 Saudi women on cloud computing skills, building two innovation centers, and making available 4,000 skill builder licenses, which is our digital learning platform for employees of the SMB market in Saudi Arabia. In addition to the importance of instilling learning through all these different val uh, valuable programs, certification and industry standard um, certification is as important. It is the main validator of the skill set at the employee level and at the employer level. At AWS, we have 12 different certifications ranging between foundational, associate, professional, and special speciality, depending on the job roles. We have the machine learning specialty certification, and earlier this summer, we announced the release of the AI practitioner certification at a foundational level, building on what Dr. Professor Ashok mentioned, we need to do foundational learning and awareness. And we also announced the release of the machine learning engineer associate certification. Together, we have three certifications at Amazon Web Services, which targets the machine learning, the artificial intelligence, and the Gen AI emerging technologies, each at a different level, catering for the, uh, uh, let's say, the profile and the prerequisites of the learners who wish to embark on this journey. With this, I want to basically wrap up by summarizing the rapid evolution of emerging technologies is massive. It's going to bring massive opportunities, but of course, it's bringing its own challenges. In order to address this challenge of the skills gap, private sector has to proactively invest in building the workforce internally and externally, and they need to collaborate with educational institutions to address that. Thank you, and almost on time. Good. Thank you, Maria. For the presentation here. Uh, I'm quite an avid uh, Amazon shopper, and it pleases me that uh, all that shopping is going to public benefit. Thank you to Amazon. And, you know, very obvious tying into what our previous speakers have said 98% uh, of industry is planning to have AI powered solutions. So, yes, it is going to be used. And what Mariam has said is that the private sector must invest in developing AI skills. And Amazon is a perfect example from what they are doing with uh, six different programs they have. They have the Amazon 
uh, AWS Education Program, the AWS Academy, the Skill Center. So a perfect example here of another company who is out there knowing what the needs are of society when it comes to AI and making it easy for us to get move into the world of AI. So go out there, look for these opportunities and take it to your beneficiaries. Uh, I now call on Mr. Salma Karim from uh, Morocco to take us through the impact of AI on jobs and skills in Morocco. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi ta'ala wa barakatuh. First of all, I'd like to extend my thanks to the ITU for inviting the Digital Development Agency of Morocco to be part of this valuable panel. And second, I'd like to congratulate the Kingdom of Bahrain for hosting this event and co-organizing this successful forum. So let's dive in my presentation before uh, emphasizing what the Digital Development Agency of Morocco is doing, implementing AI on a national level. Let let me give you some uh, data about contextual use of AI and how AI is impacting the labor market in Morocco. As a developing country, Morocco is facing challenges regarding the adoption of technology and the impact about the labor work, so the job displacement, the, the skills gap, and also the ethical concern about the AI technology particularly. But we see on AI an opportunity to open up to new jobs and new economical market because AI is fostering innovation among sectors and it's a great economical growth uh, for, for the local economy but also by adopting technology it will also be uh, um, a competitive advantage in terms of uh, investment attractivity. So let me give you some elements about the Digital Development Agency of Morocco. Um, in Morocco, uh, the policy making uh, and decision, decision making, I've been aware of uh, the importance of technology and how it is impacting uh, the economy and the labor market. So that's why um, in Morocco, the Ministry of Digital Transition, for instance, and the Ministry of Higher Education, and for that, I'll uh, give you back the, the last uh, slide, are joining forces in order to develop um, the portfolio of tech training in the Moroccan universities. So in order to triple the number of tech graduates on a national level, from 8,000, we aim to target around 50,000 graduates by 2030. And in the continuity of that, reforms implementing in Morocco, the creation of the Digital Development Agency in 2019, which main mission is developing a national strategy and implementing it among the government, among the society, and among the private sector. And not only that, leveraging the national human capital technology capacities, but also working on some technology regulation and technology infrastructure. And our roadmap is rich of projects regarding all of those aspects, but we have specifically a dedicated project for national AI implementation called AI Ecosystem. And through this project, we're aiming to foster collaboration between academia and the private and public sector, and also emerge a national AI ecosystem through national AI talent from local academia. And let me talk about the first initiative that we launched regarding national implementation and AI. Since early Early 2019, we adopted a national uh, support for applied research in AI on a national level called Al Khawarizmi program. In this program, we are supporting financially 45 research in applied AI among 15 universities and research labs, and we have one of the largest research communities dedicated to AI in the country, but also in the region. And for that, we're aiming to leverage a bridge between academia and the public and public and private sector in order to exchange that data set, but also develop specific use cases, specific sectoral use cases in agriculture, health, education, tourism, industry, smart cities, and other vital sectors for the Moroccan economy. Also, we are supporting the research communities in terms of 
intellectual and industrial property and patenting, but not only that, we're trying to valorize the research uh, results in terms of concrete products and services that will emerge after the end of the program and also have a high level academics dedicated to AI on a national level. This is the first initiative. The second one would be training, AI training. In Morocco, back in 2022, we launched the national e-learning platform called Al Academia Rakhmiya. This platform is aiming to give digital literacy training to all the citizens of Morocco. But not only that, it is contributing to the national effort of tech reskilling and upskilling for the private sector and the public sector. So for that, we developed custom-made training in local dialect, Moroccan Darija, in order to be able to accompany a, nation, uh, a national human capital. We've been training since the launch. We launched in 2022. We have, piloting, we have been piloting for the first year, but generalizing since 2023, more than 30,000 beneficiaries online on self-paid based content. We have more than 4,000 beneficiaries in our webinars, but also Academia Rakhmiya is not only online training, but it's also presential in-person training. So we've been tra training since then more than 9,000 beneficiaries in different technologies. And it is one of the most fastest growing learning, co learning communities in Morocco with the a rich catalog of training with more than 200 online courses and more than a thousand uh, hours of training. And if I may focus on AI, uh, we have a dedicated learning path for AI in terms of big data, data science, deep learning, machine learning, prompt engineering, and generative AI that we are providing for different populations. And we have a total of 21 online courses and more than 140 uh, hours of training that we've been able to implement online for more than 5,000 beneficiaries and in person for more than 4,000 beneficiaries. And Academia Rakhmiya is not only a national e-learning platform and a national uh, pro training program, but it's also an educational curation um, environment because we are implementing trainings with institution, big institutions and also big tech. For instance, we are part of the ITU DTC initiative, and thanks to this initiative, we are permitting to the local citizens to have quality access to training from Cisco and HP Life and all the partners of this initiative. Not only that, we are partner partnering with big tech companies in order to facilitate access to their training content for free and for international certifications as well that we implement with Microsoft, um, IBM, Google, Meta, Huawei, um, Oracle, and other big tech companies. And uh, the third initiative will be uh, implementing ethical AI. Since 2022, Morocco officially adopted UNESCO guidelines in terms of ethical use of AI, and we since then implemented a national commission for ethical AI. The main role of this commission is to establish a national AI ethic and responsible AI framework uh, in Morocco, but also disseminated among the public and private sector and educate and raise awareness among the citizen about the responsible and ethical use of AI and foster collaboration between um, in, uh, in a regional, local and international uh, level regarding this matter. It is uh, important to emphasize that recently with UNESCO, there was a very important report that was released this year and is available online, is the AI readiness assessment report for the Kingdom of Morocco. It will give you um, a concrete picture about the technical development in Mor of Morocco in this field. So uh, if I might sum up about the use case of Morocco, if I might give you some return on experience, I would emphasize what my colleagues said, um, is that investing in human capital is key, developing lifelong learning, developing technology skills and AI skills, but not only that. AI is an emerging technology. It is raising a lot of questions regarding bias, regarding um, uh, um, responsibility regarding explainability of the algorithm and the technology, but also data privacy and cybersecurity. Those are uh, concerns that we need to address on a local level via ethical 
and responsible frameworks. And for developing AI use cases, we need to join forces between academia, private sector, and public sector to foster innovation and research through local solutions to local development problems and have a real vision for sector development use cases of AI. So this is my presentation. I hope it was useful. And thank you for your kind attention. Thank you, Salma. And just to uh, give a synopsis of what uh, Salma covered, ADD, and here is an agency, and maybe this is a plan for most developing countries, with Morocco being also a developing country, has established an agency that focuses on digital skills development. And that's a great idea. Why? Because if you try to leave it to manpower, Department of Manpower, or Department of Education, or any other Department of Social Services, look at skills or Department of Labor, they already are full with the, with the jobs that they're currently doing. So there probably is a need for a separate agency that takes on digital skills and AI and helps support those other agencies. And what they are doing is bringing together academia, the private sector, as well as research, getting all the tools and then making that available to the rest of the population. What's important, if you look at uh, Academia Rakmia, Rakmia, is also conducting training. So they see a need, they see a shortage, and they are the ones that are addressing that need and that shortage. Importantly, a very important point that you brought up is AI bias. Remember, the AI, it would be biased towards the person who programs it. So it's critical and important that you as government entities, as, uh, uh, as societal organizations, that you focus on this bias as well. I mean, our world has gone through a lot of bias. Myself, I'm from South Africa. Uh, I've been through apartheid, and the last thing we want now is to have an AI apartheid. We don't want that. So please focus on the bias as regulators. Uh, I now open the floor to questions. So um, please raise your hands. And in raising your hands, also please raise, uh, raise, give us your name, the organization you're with. And then we will take about five questions, and then we'll open up the panel. Uh, questions. Yes, I see a hand in front here. Ajeng. Thank you, Alfie. So um, I'm representing Indosat, one of the telecommunication companies in Indonesia. And I think in this panel, you also mentioned about AI for SMEs. Um, at Indosat, we also work together uh, like a program for women-led SMEs. And there are still co uh, concerns and hesitancy for these women to you know, adopt AI. So then uh, my question will be first, uh, what are the key skills for these women to first be able to adopt AI in their business? And then the second one would be, do you have any recommendation for policymakers, governments, and indus industry stakeholders like us, Indosat, in creating um, a more supportive env environment for women-led businesses, in, um, like in any emerging markets like Indonesia, to be able to adopt AI? Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? Yes, I see a hand. Abena. Thank you very much, Alfie. Um, Dr. Stain says I shouldn't panic because I was beginning to panic looking at the category of people I deal with. But he also mentioned that elementary AI um, literacy is important, which I agree. Um, but he was very emphatic on the educational system. So my question will be, how do we handle the uneducated, unconnected, poor, and the underprivileged? Do they also need um, elementary AI literacy? If they do, how do we do it? And um, Dr. Ashong also made a statement about um, education and AI. But sometimes you have um, instructions from your lecturers and they tell you plagiarism and AI enabled solution is prohibited. Are they confusing the two concepts? And if they are, how do you get some of the 
professors and lecturers to understand the distinction between the two terms. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Uh, hi, my name is Tamar Nazal from PRC Jordan. Uh, as a regulator, I have a question for you. Uh, what strategies can government bodies adopt to uh, effectively integrate AI technologies into their operations while ensuring transparency, accountability, and public trust in the decision-making processes driven by these innovations? Thank you. Okay, so we've got one question right at the back. Um, hi, thank you, Zinat from uh, DCO. And just to the doctor from OECD, love the presentation. I think you've probably given me most information from the last three days, so thank you so much. Um, Mr. Alfie, you spoke about creating an organization that will help with this digital environment. Please have a look at DCO. We um, company, we are an international organization that started about three and a half years ago in Saudi, and our focus is on our assisting member states with everything in the digital economy. We've just launched our academy in July, still very fledgling, but we focus on in the academy on providing digital skills. Um, and all other skills worth relating to the digital economy. So please have a look at the um, DCL. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, uh, we take two more questions. Uh, the ladies first, lady right in front, in the back. Yes. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Catherine from the Open University of Tanzania. Um, my question goes to Professor Eshok. Myself, I am an academician working at the university. And from your presentation, it is absolutely clear that for academicians, for lecturers, it is a constant race going along with AI. As uh, Mr. Afi said, we should keep our enemy close. So it is a constant race on how academicians, maybe we should not strive to be on top of AI, but maybe go along with it, as you have mentioned, steering up critical thinking skills for students and so on. So my question now is maybe you can share some experience from your side and also from uh, maybe the work you have done with other universities. How can universities, how can academicians also individually try to keep up with that pace. Thank you. Okay. The gentleman in front. I am Aishi Kapoor from Ministry of Communications, India. My question is regarding the importance of open source AI tools in the overall uh, ecosystem of the digital skills training program. Yes. Thank you. Panel. Shall I try and kick off? Yep. Can, can you hear me? Yep. Okay. Um, I'm going to try and take them in order. It's like, there was a young lady here who asked about, she's working with women, and how do we go about teaching students? Now, the biggest tool that we use in business schools around the world are case studies, yep. where we actually provide a narrative in terms of a decision maker who needs to make a decision and all the context behind what's going on in the organization and what should they do tomorrow morning. And in the old days, you would just be given five or 10 years of financial accounts of the company and so on. Now with the AI, we can have data sets. So we can uh, have small data sets or also as Marin, we, we actually use AWS and we can have larger data sets and say to the students, right, we want you to go away and actually analyze that data, yeah, in all the various, because first you've got to clean it and you've got to do all sorts of things before you can do anything really interesting and exciting, but it's saying that we need to be careful that 
machine learning and AI is be all and end all. Because at the end of the day, it's about solving organizational and societal problems where you've got various data sets. But apart from that, it's also about change management. It's about sort of saying, yes, you've got this fantastic uh, uh, model that you've developed in terms of predictive analytics, but how are you going to champion it in your own organization to then bring about change? Yep. Because of modeling and the data visualization and the cloud computing is one thing. Yeah, we can provide that. That's just technical knowledge. But for example, AI has no emotional intelligence, really. We as human beings have it. And that's why I was really glad Sten talking about um, the need for those social skills and emotional skills, etc. because saying that we just don't get that from AI. Uh, moving to the lady over there who was um, talking about something that, of course, affects me, affected me a lot on the first day was the lady from the ILO who was talking about how do you connect with a person who's uneducated, unskilled, uninsured, and whatever. That's quite a difficult thing. Um, one of the things we have in the UK is the group that we find hardest to get into higher education are actually white, working-class boys. Yep. So it's not black and ethnic minority students or whatever, it's white, working-class boys from a very poor background. And I think there's a lot of work governments can do in terms of that whole area. Uh, someone asked about government strategies. What can we do as governments and so on? I think at the moment I'm an external examiner at the University of Nottingham where they have a, an apprentice program. A lot of people have been talking about apprenticeships. In the UK, we say, yep, apprenticeships are great because it links students to employers, but it's within a framework. So employers also have to be committed to this. And in the UK, we have the Office for Students, but we also have Ofsted and another government agency who oversee that to make sure that with all these changes in AI, that the policies are that those two sides, both universities and employers, get together to provide those vitally needed competencies that people need for the jobs out there and those jobs changing as well. Anyway, I've said enough. I'll pass it on to my colleagues here. Uh, Sama, maybe you want to talk about how to help the uneducated, unconnected. How have we done that in, in Morocco? I'll be trying to address some of the questions. Uh, for the recommendation on an institutional level and how we do it on a national level, I think uh, I would sum up, I will give a return on Moroccan experience, for instance, Al Khawarizmi program. Uh, in order to uh, select the 45 research pro projects that we are supporting, uh, we um, did involve all of the ministerial department. For instance, the Ministry of Health did assess all of the healthcare uh, projects that we have in the submission uh, pro pro process, and as, uh, as well as the Ministry of Tourism, the Ministry of Interior, etc. So it, we made sure during the Al Khawarizmi program that all those use cases we are developing. Um, First of all, we have the sponsorship of the, the government in order to provide the necessary data sets to develop the, the, the solutions. And second, that, are, that those programs are in coherence with the national strategies regarding a certain sector, for instance, tourism, for instance, education. So AI is not a separate asset of the government, but it needs to be built in the sectoral tech the sectoral uh, strategies we already have. So this is how we do it uh, in Morocco. And for instance, in terms of education, AI is a layer of digital literacy nowadays. We need to have basic knowledge about technology, but also awareness about cybersecurity, awareness about data management and data privacy, and then we can tackle the AI aspect regarding generative AI, which is very user-friendly and very large public uh, for use. We can raise awareness about how to boost productivity and employability uh, in terms of different categories of uh, the population, youth, entrepreneurs, public servants, etc. So those are my main uh, recommendations as per the questions that they were 
Great. That were asked. Thanks, Salma. And then, uh, Mariam, on the issue of, given the academies that you'll have, several academies, how do we address the question on key skills for women? How do, and what are some of the recommendations for governments to train it? Yes, actually, I wanted to address the point around women in, okay. in SMBs, so, and it's twofold. Building on what Dr. Ashok mentioned, uh, working on use cases. So at AWS, we have various use cases across different industries for the SMB segment, which can showcase how can um, this technology support you for your business outcomes. So we make sure that this is something business decision makers, the women of those SMBs are aware of. But then also when we talk about enablement and training, we have dedicated courses that are directed towards decision makers. In addition for the technical uh, staff that we address, some content is geared towards that profile so that they can understand the business impact of leveraging such a technology. So the use cases across all the industries and then the dedicated training for the decision maker at the SMB level. Thanks, Mary. And uh, our keynote. First of all, thank you for uh, what I thought was an excellent set of questions. Um, it, it's really nice to hear such questions from the audience. And I just want to respond very briefly to three questions in particular. On women, I think we've already heard a lot uh, of very interesting answers. One thing that we find is that the impact of AI on men and women is, is very different. It's not a story of bad, good, I think they will be affected in very different ways. One thing that we notice is that men tend to be in occupations and jobs that are more at risk of AI. But what we see with women is that women are less well positioned to grab some of the opportunities that AI will bring. And that's partly because they don't have the skills, science skills, etc. When I presented that graph of the AI workforce growing very rapidly in a number of countries, that's almost exclusively male, that workforce. So women are in a very badly positions to grab some of the opportunities that AI will bring. And so I think it's very important that we invest in the skills of women. On the question of vulnerable people, uh, oh, lesser educated, poor, I think this is a really important question because I think it's those people who are most vulnerable. And so yes, absolutely, I think we need to target these people because there are many risks of AI. If people don't understand how AI works and what the risks are of AI, what the limitations are of AI, they're most more likely to fall, fall victim to some of these um, negative impacts of AI. How you do that, I'm, I'm not an expert on that, but I, I, I do think it's incredibly important that especially that layer of the population is given the skills to understand AI and interact with it. And finally, a very good question about trustworthiness in public decision making. I think one thing that I mean, AI is being increasingly used in government as well in public decision making, and it need, I think government needs to lead by examples. More and more countries are bringing in or adhering to principles around the use of AI and transparency around these principles, transparency around the use of AI is very important. Educating civil servants, etc., about AI is also very important, making sure that the people who use AI in government understand how they can use AI. And some countries are also bringing in regulation around AI, specifically uh, targeted at government and the public sector. So I think all these measures can help build public trust in, in, in decision making by governments. Great. Thanks, Molstein. So we come to the close. Uh, I would ask for each of you in a few sentences, not I know it says three words, but in a few sentences, uh, give your um, parting words, you know, this final words, certainly. Right. So be open to change, invest in your people, and collaborate between all stakeholders. Thank you. Good. Ashok, over to you. For me, it's um, about learning communities really, saying that um, it's a bit like saying, oh, I partly got into this AI stuff, but I don't know about this or that or whatever. And if there's an online community you can link into and that's very responsive, it's fantastic. So I'd say learning communities is definitely one. Adaptability of really saying that universities are into the knowledge business. We've been into knowledge, at least in 
the UK for about 1,000 years when Oxford started, and saying that knowledge will change and develop, and in five years' time, there'll be something else. Um, it won't be generative AI, it'll be something totally different. So it's being adaptable to that. Um, and thirdly, I'd say um, something close to my heart is that digital inclusion of making sure that people aren't left behind in terms of this. I know that I teach it at an advanced level, but I'm also mindful that we take everyone with us. And the most important thing that I tell my students is we're going to have fun doing it. Thanks, Ashok. Salma? Yeah, from uh, my perspective, I would talk about uh, trust. Uh, we need trust among uh, the government, the citizen, the private sector, and all the actors of the te technology landscape, and then education, and fostering innovation and collaboration, and then uh, use cases to tackle uh, local development issues with new perspective technology solutions made by the local communities. Excellent, great. Thanks so much. Stain. So I think that a lot of the fear that exists around AI is because people think it's something that's inevitable that will happen to us and we need to suffer it. And so I think it's a wrong question to ask what AI will do to us. I think the right question to ask is what we want AI, what we want AI to do for us. And so it's really about decisions that we make informed decisions mm -hmm. that we make about how we want to use AI, what we want to use it for. And I think if we manage that, then we will make a success of AI. Excellent, great. Thanks for that, Stan. So, people, I'd like to leave you to one thing, and that is, there's one thing that every single one of you have been, every single, including me, every single one of us has been a baby. Anyone disagrees? Anyone here hasn't been a baby? No, every single one of us has been a baby. And how have we grown? We've grown with adapting. So adaptability is critical. And we have it in us. Each one of us has that in us to adapt. We have the skill to adapt. AI is coming along. Let's use that adaptable skill and adopt AI and continue in a prosperous world. Thank you all. Well, thank you very much for sharing your knowledge with all of us, ladies and gentlemen. Now, as we go to our lunch break, I would like to remind you that we will meet back here at uh, 2 o'clock for the final closing session and remarks. Uh, during that time, I'd like to remind all participants to please share their feedback by scanning the QR code that you will see on the venue screens. That would really help us knowing more <clears throat> about um, what you think and your impression of this forum. And one more thing, um, for those of you who registered for the giveaways, the winners have been sent an email to notify them that they have won. So for those winners, you can head to the ITU booth to receive your gift. So thank you very much, and we'll meet back here at 2 o'clock. See you then. Okay. Thank you. Well shared. Very good.